everybody here with us this morning. Appreciate that good music. That's the good stuff. Amen. Have your Bibles. Turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 2. Isaiah, chapter 2. And go to verse 12. Father, I need the gift of teaching this morning, Lord. And Father, I need strength from Thee. I need the anointing, Father, to preach here in a little while. And I pray that You'd open the hearts of the people, Father, and give us that spirit of learning today. We ask it in Thy holy name. Amen. All right. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> Isaiah 2.12. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. Isaiah the prophet therefore introduces for us the day of the Lord. And in your Bible, if you'll notice, it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's called printer's type. Purpose of that is so that you'll know that it is Jehovah. yod heh vow Hey, the Tetragrammaton, is here with the uh, vowel points that there's so much contention about today, whether it's Jehovah or Yahweh or whatever folks want to call him. I'm going to stick with the old thing with the Masoretic vowel points and call him Jehovah. Amen. But anyway, it's the, it's the covenant-keeping God. L-O-R-D, covenant-keeping God, and it's called the Day of the Lord. Now you'll find running over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament the prophecy about the Day of the Lord. The Day of the Lord has to do with, has to do with uh, immediate judgment. It has to do with something that's going to happen right then. But it's all for also prophetic in the sense that it speaks into the future and talks about a future time. And that future time is very important. It's like the prophecy of the Messiah. You got to, it's very important to understand the prophecy of the Messiah. Look over here in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 60. 61, Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 and verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord, Jehovah, hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Now watch this. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's the year of Jubilee. Now watch what follows. And the day of vengeance of our God. And the Lord Jesus in Nazareth in the synagogue got up and read that scripture. But he stopped short and he looked at them and said, today is the scripture fulfilled in your, in your hearing, in your eyes, in your sight. Where did he stop? The day of vengeance. Now, this is important because the Lord Jesus obviously has the right to stop anywhere he pleases. And if he interprets the Bible, whatever he says is period. That's it. And he stopped it here and he had a reason for stopping it here because the day of vengeance is the day of the Lord. Amen. See, that's the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord did not come at the first coming. The day of the Lord will come at the second advent, which is stretched out over a period of a thousand and seven years. Amen. Not just one day. The day with the Lord's a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. When God uses the term day, sometimes it's symbolic of an extended period of time. This is important to understand, though. This is what's called hermeneutics. It's a big, long word. Just let folks know you've been to Bible college. That's all that means. But what it means is the science of interpreting the Scripture. And the Bible says to rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. This is where... So many denominations today exist in Christianity, so many different de denominations. I think at one count it was something like 20 or 30,000. I don't know what it is. It's an astronomical figure, unbelievable figure. 
And every one of them stand up and look you eyeball to eyeball and say, we're the, one, we're the only ones telling the truth. You know, it's our crowd and we have it. And um, no doubt in my mind that many, many, many brothers and sisters are in all these denominations. I'm not worried about that. Denominations are man-made for men. One church, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. But here you have a good example of how the Bible breaks two distinct time periods apart. But it's in one scripture verse. And it's so important to understand this because this understanding of the day of the Lord is an understanding of Bible prophecy. If you get the day of the Lord right, then a lot of other things are going to come together right, correctly. If you get the day of the Lord wrong, then you're going to be in trouble. You'd be amazed at how many amillennial and postmillennial, and that's usually the high church and the mainline Protestant denominations. They're either amillennial or postmillennial, mostly amillennial. Amillennial means no millennium. Postmillennial means after the millennium. Their definition of the millennium is a spiritual period of time where God is reigning over the earth and at the end of that time he'll come back and he'll come back in judgment and judge the nations. He'll set the sheep on the right hand, the goats on the left and call an end to it. That's a, that's a simplistic definition of it, but it gets off into different categories. But I believe that the millennium is a real period of time. And it's from the conjunction of two Latin words, mill and anum. Mill is a thousand, anum is year, so uh, a thousand year period of time. The book of Revelation says, and they ruled and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And uh, I either take that for what it says or I try to spin it into some kind of a, some, some kind of a symbolic or spiritual application. You can't do that. So this idea here in the book of Isaiah chapter number 61 where the Lord Jesus closed the book and here's where he closed it to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and laid it down. But in the text all you have is a comma. <laughs> a comma separates 2,000 years of prophecy. Yeah, boy, that's a, that's a heavy-duty thing. But there's no arguing. If you've read over there where the Lord stood up at Nazareth and read from the Scripture, He closed the book, and He was reading from Isaiah that you're reading from. See? So the day of the Lord is a prophetic day that has to do with God's judgment on the earth, but it has more than that. It also has to do with the reign on this earth of Christ. He'll reign a thousand years. It has to do with the restoration of Israel to its rightful place at the head of all the nations. And the earth will experience or enjoy a reformation, a restoration. The wolf shall lie down with the lamb. And the child shall put his hand over the, uh, the, uh, the cockatrice den, over a snake's uh, head and hole. And, uh, and the rains are going to come, the former rain and the latter rain. And the plowman shall overtake the reaper and things like that. They'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. This is a thousand years of glory and peace and joy on this earth like it's never known before. Which immediately brings up the next issue. Who was the earth made for? What is this all about anyway? The Bible says that the meek shall inherit the earth. And when you go into the mainline Protestant denominations that are amillennial, you'll get that message week in, week out, week in, week out, week in, week out. You'll get the Beatitudes. That's what they're called. The Beatitude has to be due to the blessing. Says, so is there anything wrong with the Beatitudes? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But you've got to rightly divide the Scripture. Amen. Rightly divide it. The Beatitudes are literally the constitution of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven here on this earth. And the Beatitudes, therefore, have to do with an earthly people living under a sovereign reigning in Jerusalem. And the idea today that if you, uh, uh, if you, if you believe that the, that the earth, that the meek are going to inherit this earth in the situation it's in right now, that's an erroneous thing because the Bible said evil men, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. 
deceiving and being deceived. The earth is not getting better, it's getting worse. This again brings you to the point, what, how will I interpret the scripture? So what do I do with that? Well, it, this, is the, this is important. That the Beatitudes are the constitution of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the law. The highest law. The other day you saw Donald Trump put his hand on two Bibles and swore to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. That Constitution is the highest form of law in this country. So this is what we're talking about. We're talking about the Beatitudes. But the Beatitudes, as they are presented to you in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're not in John. They're not in John. They're not in the Gospel of John at all. No reference is made to them whatsoever. And if you've been in here studying with me in the past, you'll know why that John does not include the Beatitudes because the Gospel of John was the last Gospel by far written and its application is not to the children of Israel as a kingdom here on this earth. It is to all mankind. The Gospel of the grace of God. So this, uh, the Beatitudes, therefore, have to do with the gospel, have a kingdom, all right? The day of the Lord is a period of time that I believe is going to be literal, and I believe it's going to be right here on this earth, and I believe that it's going to come to pass exactly as the Bible says it will. And we've never known a day like that yet on this earth. You certainly don't believe right now that God's reigning over this earth, do you? No, this is not his kingdom. He said, my kingdom is not of this world, of this age. Uh, and uh, he, he's not reigning over this world right now. No. Uh, you saw a, a, a so-called million women yesterday marching against, uh, uh, against the, uh, the new president. And I don't know how much you saw of what went on there, but there was some stuff going on there that you didn't want to see. You didn't want to see. What you need to do is to get some of the British newspapers and look at the photographs that they took and you'll find Satanist. You'll find every vile thing on the face of this earth is, uh, is part of that march. And these people, these women are adamant about the fact that they won't control over their bodies. And what do you mean by that? They want to kill babies. They're baby killers. That's what it's about. It's about killing babies. And uh, there's no way that I can countenance that. I can't have any part to do with a crowd like that. They're baby killers. But in any event, do you think that's the kingdom of Christ? You think, you think this reflects the kingdom of God? No. So we're not kingdom builders. We're not here today to propagate the kingdom. We're not here today to build up the kingdom. What we're doing is preaching the gospel of the grace of God. And the gospel of the grace of God, he calls a bride out of this world for his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you get to the New Testament, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, if you'd like to turn there with me. Second Thessalonians chapter number two. And verse number one. The apostle says, We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, he's already been here, so he's talking about him coming back. And by our gathering together unto him. <clears throat> that you be not soon shaken in mind, be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Most of the new Bibles, just about all of them, and I haven't looked at every one of them, I've got probably... 20 or 25 on my computer say day of the Lord and see that's where you get into big trouble here because the day of the Lord is a period of time that spans a thousand and seven years the day of the Lord is a long time and the day of the Lord 
you say, well, then what's the difference here then? Why, why does it make such a difference? Well, the day of, first of all, it makes a difference because the day of Christ that the apostle mentions in two other places in the New Testament, the day of Christ is the day for the church. The church, us, the born again believers. The day of the Lord is not for the church. It's not a prophecy relating to the church, you see. But the day of Christ is. So some scribe back there in the first century after Christ changed Christos to Kyrios. And the Greek word Kyrios is translated Lord. Christos, what would you think Christos would be? Christ, of course. Christos. It's a, uh, it's a masculine noun. And uh, Christos is translated Christ, Messiah, Mashiach. So the day of Christ is a day that lasts for seven years, not a thousand and seven. The day of Christ will only run seven years, and the reason it only runs seven years is because the church is in heaven with Christ, and then at the end of the seven-year period of time, it comes back with him. And Revelation 19, when the heavens open, the church is coming back with Christ, and they're coming back to judge the earth. So the day of Christ spans that seven-year period of time. It's very important because it tells you right here that the man of sin, the son of perdition, will be made manifest to the church of Christ. That's us. Have you seen any candidates lately? There have been some good ones out there. And more are rising up all the time. These candidates are human beings just like you, just like me, born a human birth, just like any of us. And according to Revelation chapter number 13, they have a wound, they have a deadly wound to their head, a deadly wound. In other words, they die, and three days later, they come back to life again. Amen. This candidate, it comes back to life again. The first three and one half years, it is the man of sin, a person who chooses to reject Christ and reject the gospel and follow Satan. And then when the deadly wound is struck, that person dies. And three days later, they rise from the dead. Amen. And when they rise from the dead, they rise from the dead as Satan incarnate. And that's the son of perdition. Amen. Only one person in the Bible is called the son of perdition. Amen. And that's Judas Iscariot. He's a man of Kirath, Ish Kirath, Ishkariot. He's called the son of perdition. Now the word perdition in the Bible is also akin to the word Apollyon because the word Apollyon means destroyer. And the word Abaddon, which is a Hebrew word, means destroyer. And it's quite a remarkable study to go to the Old Testament and run the references on destroyer or, the dis or Abaddon because that's the Hebrew Old Testament counterpart of Apollyon in the New. And you'd be amazed at some of the things that the Old Testament begins to reveal about Apollyon. Now, you remember I've told you how they built this CERN, this, 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 uh, this largest machine ever built by a man in CERN, Switzerland. And this, this thing is built over an ancient site to Apollyon a cave, an entrance to the underworld, to the netherworld. So the bottom line is that this Antichrist will literally be the spirit of Apollyon or Abaddon incarnate in flesh. He's the destroyer. And he's going to come back upon this earth and he will come back with great wrath. For the Bible says in Revelation chapter number 12, when he's cast down to the earth, he knows he has but a short time. So he comes back in judgment. Now this is coming. And I want you to keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes open for the Antichrist. Now we've got an awful lot of people telling the church members that you're going to go through the tribulation period. They say you're going to go through the tribulation. And they use passages in Matthew. For example, Matthew chapter number 24 and 25 to prove that point. And it talks about in Matthew 24 how you've got five wise and five foolish virgins. They all had oil. But the five foolish virgins lost their oil. It was used up. 
and they didn't have oil when the bridegroom came. But five wise did. So half of them get cast off into judgment, damnation, and hell fire, and five of them are saved. It tells you to watch, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Doth come. And then it talks about the bridegroom coming. And it's important to understand that the bridegroom coming is a Jewish reference to a Jewish people because they're looking for the bridegroom to come. For us, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back. And he said in, he said in the book of John, chapter number 14, if I go away, I will come again and receive you to myself that where you are, there, where I am, there you may be also. And he could come at any moment because the apostle Paul said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Amen. Now, it's not a mystery of the day of the Lord. That was not a mystery. There's not a mystery in the day of the Lord. That's prophesied all over the Old Testament. So what mystery could the Apostle Paul possibly be talking about? He's talking about the mystery of the rapture of the body of Christ, Amen. of the believers. In 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, he said, we shall not all sleep. He said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Amen. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye. The Lord Jesus Christ tells us to be up on guard 24-7. Everywhere we go, every waking moment of the day, to look for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ because he could come at any minute. Amen. When people tell you that the gospel of the kingdom must be preached to the ends of the earth before Christ can come back, they're confusing the day of the Lord and the gospel of the kingdom of heaven with the gospel of the grace of God. Amen. There's not one sign that has to be fulfilled. There's not one thing that has to be done before the Lord Jesus comes back and gets his bride. When the Apostle Paul began to reveal about the day of Christ, he was talking about something that was new, completely new. The day of the Lord was not new, but the day of Christ was new. And so what he was saying is that the church will be here when the very man of sin himself shows up. But when he becomes the son of perdition, we're gone. And we will see him, folks. We will see this man of sin. Now, we, if you are a Bible reader and a, and a prayer and somebody who tries to walk with God and stay in fellowship with the Lord, you should be absolutely appalled at the way this country has gone and the social conditions in America. You should be appalled at it. I mean, you should absolutely, you should be, you should be taken completely aback by the fact that the federal government under, under this last president issues a decree to the nation that a man can use a woman's bathroom. Amen. That's completely, completely insane. Amen. That's insanity. And you should, you should be appalled with the idea that somebody wants to come along and ram perversion down your throat. And how you feel about it means nothing to these people. It means nothing to them. And every time I see their bumper sticker that says, coexist, I think you're the biggest hypocrite that ever lived. Amen. That is pure hypocrisy. What do you mean coexist? Amen. It's not us marching in the street. Right. It's not us uh, threatening to burn, blow up the White House. Amen. It's not us uh, burning people in effigy. It's not us with the four-letter words flying left and right all over the place. But it's coming from them. The most intolerant people on this earth. The most fascist, bigoted, narrow-minded, exclusive people on this earth is a progressive liberal. Amen. Yet the news media completely turns it around and makes it look like it's you. The Jeffers, the preacher down there in Texas. This, he's, he's eloquent. He speaks very well. And I believe he's a born-again believer. I believe he's a brother. But uh, he's associated with uh, Donald Trump, and they're saying that he is a radical. They're talking about what a radical he is. They're trying to connect him with Hitler. And all kinds of, all kinds of garbage is coming from these people and the reason it is, folks, is because these people are anti-Christ and anti-God. If your, if your grandparents 
uh, could, uh, would, were, were in this world today and watching this, they'd literally go into shock. Yes, sir. They'd go into shock. I mean, but we're like frogs in the water. The temperature now is rising, and here we sit. <laughs> and that's what's happened. And the people are tolerating stuff today that was completely intolerable just a few years ago. You know why? Because the whole world is being prepared in spirit for the coming of the man of sin. They've got to prepare him. They've got to prepare him. And this is why they, apparently for every, everything I can see about it, there's a revival in Russia of Christianity. Now, most of it granted is the Russian Orthodox Church. But folks, don't just dismiss a church because you don't like high liturgy or this or that, crossing yourself and all of that. You remember those girls that died over there in Iraq, and they crossed themselves. But they died before they would renounce the Lord Jesus Christ at the hands of those murdering Muslim butchers. And one day you're going to meet those girls, and you're going to meet real courage. And I'm talking about young girls. And they died for their faith in Christ. So let's not come off, let's come off our high horse. And I get so sick of some of these fundamental Baptist preachers. I'm telling you the truth, I do, man. I've been in this business a long time. I get sick of them. Because, buddy, they, some of the most narrow-minded people that ever lived are these people who come along and they mock people and make fun of them for the stuff they've got in their churches and all that. Uh, get a life, man. God's people are all over this earth. If you've been born again by the grace of God, you know the Lord Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're willing to die for the name of Christ, it, it tells me you're born again. Amen. Because I know an awful lot of Baptists that hooped and hollered and walked around in here and shouted, and now they're out drunk. Are you listening? Amen. Amen. That's the real world. That's the reality of it. They're out here drunk. And they were running up and down these aisles and shouting and praising God at one time. So I'm glad the judge will take care of all that, aren't you? I am. I'm glad. I'm glad I'm not the judge. I'll leave that to him. I'll leave it to him. It's a, it's, a very, it's a very complicated, confused time that we live in. And the reason for that is because everybody's being prepared for the Antichrist. They're being prepared for the rise of the man of sin. Do you realize, my dear friend, that, that, uh, that uh, what was it, 56 million people in this country voted for a woman that will kill a baby in a heartbeat? 56 million people in this country voted for a woman that will support uh, a, a man walking into a girl's bathroom. 56 million people in this country voted. She won the popular vote. Aren't you glad that the framers of this country were smart people? They were very smart. They really were. That electoral college is something because it gives the nation a voice. It gives every state and every county a voice. That's a good thing. That's a good thing, because if it wasn't for that, uh, Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, places like that would rule the nation. Democracy is okay as long as it is constrained by republic. Pure democracy, you don't want any part of. Pure democracy is a drunken mob going down a street and beating people because they're not part of their, of their group. That's pure democracy. I want no part of pure democracy. I want a republic with a constitution that, that select the lady that's holding the scales, that administers justice to all. And we all have a voice, but that voice is tempered by the fact that we all make up this nation and not just a few little pockets Amen. of concentrated voters. Amen. 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 They were very smart. They really were. And the more you look at it, the more you say to yourself, my goodness gracious, it's almost like the good Lord had a hand in it. <laughs> and he did. He did. He did. He did. So therefore, I am premillennial. Premillennial. That means I believe the Lord Jesus is going to come and he's going to catch us up and take us out of this world. And he's going to do it before a real millennium takes place. And I believe the millennium is a literal thousand year period of time. According to the book of Revelation, chapter number 20. I believe that. Fully believe it. 
And I believe that this earth has yet to see its greatest day because the Lord Jesus is going to come back and he's going to reign in Jerusalem and he's going to take the kingdoms of this world and they will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Revelation chapter 11. He'll take them. The earth will never offer them to him. He'll take them. But you see, the earth is not made for you. It's not made for you. The meek shall inherit the earth. Who's that? The Jews. The earth was made for the Jews, for the Jewish people. It was made for them. And the earth in the millennium will, be, will have the Jews at the head of all the nations. And all of the Gentile nations will have to observe the Jews and their feast of tabernacles. They, become the, they literally become the head of the nations. The Jews do. And the Jews will be right here on this earth and they'll be and they'll be and they'll be here on this earth restored to their land and restored to their kingdom and their king. We will be here for a thousand years on this earth reigning with Christ for a thousand years. That's a long time. I have yet to read anything anywhere that really begins to develop what that millennium is about. What's the point? in Christ reigning for a thousand years on this earth. You ever thought about that? There's got to be a reason for it. A thousand years is a long time. What is the point? Why does he want to come back and reign on this earth and you reign on this earth for a thousand years? Because this earth is not going to be our eternal home. In Revelation it says a new Jerusalem is coming down from God out of heaven. And that new Jerusalem is the bride of the Lamb. And that new Jerusalem has 12 foundations, which are the apostles. It has 12 gates, the 12 tribes of Israel. You cannot separate Israel from the church of God. You can't do it. You don't realize it. A lot of people don't realize it. Many of you do. You don't realize how deeply the church of God owes the Jewish people and the Old Testament for our faith. Folks, that Old Testament is a Jewish book, yet you believe it is inspired of God. How many believe that? I certainly do. But that's a Jewish book. There's no other people on this earth that we have a debt to, like the Jews, for what they've given us. You know, these people, a lot of them running around out here and they say, I ain't got any use for a Jew, blah, blah, this and that, and blah, blah. Well, then tear half your Bible up and throw it away Amen. because they gave you that Old Testament. Amen. And the Apostle Paul said, I'm a debtor both. I'm a debtor to them. I'm a debtor to them. And Romans chapter number 11, they're the natural olive tree and we're the, we're the, we're the wild olive branches that have been, been uh, brought into that. So we have a great debt to the Jews. Don't you think it's quite remarkable what's happening right now? With a Jew at the right hand of the president, Kushner, a very smart one. He's 35 years old. He's already a multimillionaire. His wife is a multimillionaire. One of the, uh, one of the vile, vile, vile left-wing radicals made a vile statement the other day about the president and his daughter. And I'm not going to repeat it in this church house. A vile statement. Now that shows you what kind of people you're dealing with. But don't you know that, that uh, Kirshner, don't you know that Kirshner is going to change the policy of the United States of America toward Israel? Amen. Benjamin Netanyahu is getting ready to meet with Donald Trump. Jerusalem, folks, is the centerpiece. It is the major point of all Bible prophecy Amen. and the day of the Lord. Amen. America's time as a nation, along with the nations of the earth, may be running out quickly. You say, what do you mean by that? If the Lord comes back and catches up his bride, seven years later, God is going to put the sheep nations on one side and the goat nations on the other side and they're either going to go into the millennium 
and they're going to serve God in the millennium or they're going to be turned into hell. Amen. If the United States of America wants to exist for the next thousand years, it had better get right with Israel. <laughs> That's right. I'm talking about the nation as a corporate body. I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about the nation. If the flag of old glory is going to fly for a thousand years, it'll only fly for a thousand years as it relates to the way this nation treats Israel. It's that simple. And it's strange how God has planted a Jew and he is a senior advisor. Did you know that? To the president. And they keep talking about a senior advisor, 35 years old, up here in the White House who is advising the president and that relates to foreign policy. Folks, I'll tell you this morning, tune into this. Watch what happens with the United States and its relationship now with Israel and mark it down when it becomes obvious and it will become obvious that the United States has renewed and restored Israel to the rightful place of an ally in that part of the country, the only democracy, the only democracy that exists in that Arab world, once it restores Israel to its rightful place, you can count on this. These Arab countries are going to come against Israel and America, and it may very well be what it takes to get a peace treaty going and watch the one who signs that peace treaty. So what are you saying? I'm saying the fact that Kushner is at the right hand of the President of the United States and he's a Jew. Now, he's not, only, he's, he's not, he's not one of these uh, Jews by race. He is an Orthodox Jew. His parents were Orthodox Jews and I think his grandmother or grandfather was a, was a, was a, a Holocaust survivor. One or the other. I forget. I read it the other day. But I don't remember. His grandmother or grandfather was a Holocaust survivor out of Hitler's death camps in Europe in World War II. So this thing could blow up very quickly. And if you see somebody, when this thing blows up, if you see somebody coming in there to make peace with Israel, that is the sign. That's the red flag. That's what you're looking for. Because the man who makes the peace is the Antichrist. Because he'll sign a covenant the Bible said Israel will sign a covenant with the Antichrist, and God says, I'm going to break that. I'm going to make, I'm going to null it. But you go ahead and you sign your covenant, and that covenant could be any, it could be no more than six months from now. Amen. Wouldn't that be something? Amen. You want to see this preacher get excited, you let him come back in here and tell you they've signed a peace agreement over there. <laughs> but we, I get real excited about that because the Lord's coming back. Amen. Hallelujah to God. <laughs> That's the greatest thing that could happen for us. Don't you think, just a few months ago, nobody thought about this. Before the election, you know, everybody thought Hillary would win. Yeah. And now all of a sudden we've got a different man in there. And now we've got a Jew at his right hand, an Orthodox Jew, and he's a top advisor in the White House, 35 years old, married to his daughter. <laughs> Only God can raise up something like that that quickly. Nobody saw that coming. I got uh, back in my office the, a few months back, and I went in there and started cleaning a bunch of books out, just old stuff I've been gathering for years and years. I had, I had a stack of prophecy books this high. You know what I did with them? I threw them in the garbage can up here. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about books that were written, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, talking about uh, the communism is going to do this, and this is going to happen, and that's going to happen. I just gathered the whole thing up and threw it away. Amen. Just a bunch of junk. They made a lot of money on it, but none of it happened. How many of you have read any prophecy book written by any prophecy teacher that said anything about a Jew sitting at the right hand of the President of the United States of America and, uh, and advising him at the, top, at the highest level that, that, that affects American policy? You haven't, have you? All right, have you heard anything from any of the prophets? You got all these prophets out here, you know. <laughs> Have you heard anything from any of the prophets that said anything about a Jew sitting at the right hand of the President of the United States of America advising him on policy of this nation? 
an Orthodox Jew. I haven't heard any prophets either, have you? You'd think at least they'd get that if they get anything else. But it happened just like that. And it's going to happen just like that. And when this happens, it's going to happen, and he's going to come back. Hallelujah to God. This is exciting time. I'm excited. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, I heard that too. Yes, I heard that too. Yes, I did. Yeah, if he couldn't make a peace, he wants peace. Trump wants peace. You know, he wants he wants peace. And he knows that if you got peace over there, then you're going to be able to have there's prosperity and all the rest of it that goes with it. Sure he does. But who's going to be the one that signs the peace treaty? And who are they going to make it with? That's what we need to watch out for. It may be somebody that comes up out of obscurity all of a sudden from nowhere. And he's the one that signs the peace treaty. It would be nice if before he did that, they kicked that crowd off of the Hudson River out of this country Amen. and quit paying all those billions of dollars to keep that thing going. They call it the United Nations. That's a piece of garbage. Amen. That's all it is. Just a piece of junk. That's all it is. All right, we've got a couple of minutes left. Anybody have a question or anything you want to say before we before we close? <laughs> yes, ma'am. You mean the local paper here? Yeah. No, they're not going to. They made a big deal here. The local news did. I forget which state network it was, six, ten, twenty, whatever it was. But one of them, they they had, they had this big section on these red hat ladies that had knitted these hats and they were wearing them up to the uh, to the to the march up there. And uh, I don't know if you folks know what that red red hat represents, and I'm not going to say right here in the church house. But boy, they made a big deal about that on TV. They'll cover that. They'll cover that. They sure will, because that's their agenda. Somebody said a long time ago, smart man, he said, don't ever give an interview to the news media. They'll twist it and distort it. Don't ever trust them. Yes, sir. This sounds pretty, uh, I respect Brother Franklin Graham. Yes. He sure did, but he read it right out of the Bible in Jesus' name, he said. Yes, he did. I thought he did a fine job. That's right. He laid it out there. He sure did. He sure did. He couldn't have picked a better scripture than First Timothy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. 2018. Uh-huh. Is how many years? Seventy. Okay. <laughs> May the fourteenth, twenty eighteen. Yes, sir. The uh, the Episcopalian Church that they did the prayer meeting in yesterday. Apparently, that's a very liberal church, and they did not want Donald Trump in there. And if you notice, if you watched it, you saw all the ecumenicism, all the all the world religions in there. They even had some witch doctor in there, and all kind of nonsense. But they sure did. It was, it's pretty crazy to see how the liberals are. They sure are pushing it. Ecumenicism. Oh, he had more praying and more and more uh, and more more Bible and yeah. more references to God. I thought to myself, he's going to start out like that. He'll be preaching for he's fin finishing four years. <laughs> yeah, he did. He sure did. Yes, ma'am. He 
He's got a four-star general in there right now. They've confirmed him as Secretary of Defense. Mattis, he's probably already formulating his plan as to how to strike these murdering Muslims. And when he hits them, he'll hit them, buddy. You better believe it. He sure will. Yes, sir. I went to see him yesterday. He's sitting up. He's he's doing remarkably well. He's got pain, but uh, they they were. He said right then when I was in there, the nurse is going to change what they're giving him for the pain, but everything else is doing real good. He's it's remarkable at how well he's doing. I've and you know you just went through that, and I told him I said I've seen a lot of people go through this, and I said brother you are doing better than most of them I've ever seen. He's doing real well. So just keep praying for Tony. Yes. Yes. All right. We'll have a word of prayer and let you go. And, uh, start serving 15 minutes. Brother Crane, will you dismiss us, please?